Thank you, Weir, for that warm welcome. And it's great to be in this historic structure. Some of us are historic people, <laughs> and we appreciate history, especially if it's being renovated. <laughs> it's great to see uh, many old friends, family, some people who've endured this talk more than once here tonight in town hall, and uh, I'm going to a talk for half an hour or so, and then after that, I hope there are questions. People ask me why I wrote this book. There are many reasons to capture a thread of Seattle history, to recount exciting days of political reform, to remember what we did to create a new model of a prosecutor's office. But one day, my friend and former U.S. Attorney Mike McKay made a point that becomes the best reason of all. The justice model we created, and which has been continued and expanded by Norm Mailing and Dan Satterberg over four decades, is a precious community asset that must be guarded and preserved. All it would take is one election putting in place a person who did not believe in the justice model, who thought the prosecutors should be more political or less active in pursuing justice reform throughout the system, and this precious asset would be endangered or worse, destroyed. The reason is even more important now, even today, after a year of community tragedy starting with Ferguson and the news today about Chicago, puts us in the spotlight. I believe that some of these disasters might have been prevented had the justice systems in those places been more like what we enjoy today in King County. In other words, there are lessons to be learned from what we did 45 years ago that are applicable all over the country right now. Let's start with vice. Vice in Seattle is almost as old as the city itself. Ten years after the landing at Alki Point, John Pinnell started the Illahi, a brothel on the Duwamish Tide Flats, staffed by Indian women. Because the men who logged and fished all week sought relief on weekends, the Illahi was a great success. Within a few years, it paid the city $1,200 a year in license fees. Now this was, even though brothels were illegal under state and territorial law, in practice though, the city enforced these laws only by licensing the illegal activity in the establishments. In the mid-1880s, nearly 90% of Seattle's general fund revenue came from license fees on brothels, gambling, liquor, and box houses. Some of you might ask, what is a box house? It's an early Seattle invention. It was a theater where the second level mezzanine was above the auditorium, and it had many rooms, each with a door to the corridor, a window onto the stage, and a sofa bed. Women who performed on stage circulated in the corridor, serving drinks and servicing customers. Licensing and regulating vice was the first vestige of Seattle's tolerance policy. And by the turn of the century, the issue of vice versus virtue came up at almost every election for mayor. Seattle's early embrace of vice reached its apogee under our most shameless mayor, Hiram Gill. He was elected on a platform of a wide open city, strongly supported by Colonel Bleffen of the Seattle Times. After his election, Gill and his police chief, Charles Wappenstein, established open vice districts around the city. He'd promised that in the campaign, but the districts extended into neighborhoods far beyond what he had promised. And so, an outraged citizenry led by the Reverend Mark Matthews of the First Presbyterian Church, launched a recall campaign against Mayor Gill, and he was quickly recalled. 
But at the next election, he was back. He was running as a reformer. He said, I'm the best man to clean up the city because I know exactly where it is dirty. <laughs> all this began a vice virtue cycle that dominated city politics all the way until World War II and the election of Mayor William Devon. Mayor Devon and his city council codified the modern tolerance policy. That means that the city did not prohibit, but rather licensed, minor forms of gambling like punch boards, pinballs, and pull tabs, all of which were clearly illegal under state law. With various twists and turns, tolerance remained the city policy for the next 30 years. And this wasn't panty andy stuff. The amounts of money were, were huge. Profits just to pinball operators in one year, 1964, amounted to $25 million, which is like 200,000 today. Licensed revenue to the city averaged $500,000 per year during the 1960s. The police payoff system grew up inside this environment. The SPD vice squad, the sergeant in charge, came to the city council every month just before the licensing committee meeting to deliver, deliver a list. The list was of the establishments that they recommended be licensed to carry out these activities. The city council committee passed the list. The licenses were issued. Establishments that paid off the police department were licensed. Those that did not were harassed until they paid. So fundamentally, the tolerance policy was an official endorsement of municipal corruption. In pursuit of licensed revenue, the city told the police to arrest only some criminals, regardless of state law. So in, in the later part of this tolerance episode, I came back to Seattle from law school. I'd grown up here and been away for 10 years. And in the late 60s, some friends and I were involved in many reform activities. It was that, that era. It was a sort of reform was going on. At the same time, violent protests were going on. Uh, the first thing we were involved in was the campaign to end the blue laws. This was Initiative 229 in 1966. Before that initiative passed, if you were having dinner at Rosalini's 410, at the stroke of midnight on Saturday, the waiter would come and remove your wine glass and your bottle of wine, and you went home. That was an amazing coalition of the Seventh-day Adventists, who didn't like Sunday being celebrated as the Sabbath, and the Restaurant Association, who would rather continue to pour wine. The next year, 1966, we launched something called CHECK, Choose an Effective City Council. We endorsed Phyllis Lamphere and Tim Hill. It was a bipartisan effort, one Democrat, one Republican. And their victory started a five-year transformation of the city council. The next year, Sam Reed and I started something called Action for Washington, where we brought young people, high school and college students, into the statewide Republican campaigns behind Dan Evans, Slade Gorton, uh, the Secretary of State, whose name was Lud Kramer, and an amazing new character on the scene named Art Fletcher. Art was the first African American to run statewide, and he came very close to beating the former UW football coach, Cowboy Johnny Sherberg, for Lieutenant Governor. The year after that, 1969, a Democrat named Wes Ullman was elected mayor of Seattle. And after that, those of us in these reforms who were Republicans thought you know, one of us should do something significant. And what we thought was significant would be to run against the incumbent King County prosecutor, Charles O'Carroll, who was completely entrenched and had never been challenged uh, or anyone had come close to him. Our timing was great. The Seattle Times had launched an investigative series written by two men called the Wilson Twins, who really weren't even related, uh, that investigated the tolerance policy and the payoff system. 
That was in 67. In 68, the Post-Intelligencer, which used to be a printed paper in the morning, uh, their editor, Lou Guzzo, launched an all-out assault on prosecuting attorney Charles O. Carroll, known to everyone as Chuck. Chuck Carroll was the closest thing Seattle ever had to a political boss. Before that, he was a heroic Washington Husky, being one of only three football players in history to have their jerseys retired. If there had been a Heisman Trophy when he was playing in the late 1920s, he would have been a serious candidate. He ruled the courthouse and the county Republican Party. He also had curious friends, one of whom was a man named Ben Saichi, who owned the master pinball license for King County. The Seattle PI learned that the prosecutor met Mr. Saichi at his home on Federal Avenue at around the same time every month. On one such evening, photographer Dave Potts hid in the bushes and caught, and caught the prosecuting attorney and the holder of the master pinball license in a photograph outside Chuck Carroll's house. And Mr. Saichi was carrying a black bag, which appeared to be full of something. Nobody knows what. <laughs> a crucial development shortly after that was President Nixon's appointment of Whatcom County Prosecutor Stan Pitkin to be the U.S. Attorney for Western Washington. This was a very important event in this whole story. Governor Evans and the state Republicans, who were in a bitter warfare with the King County Republicans led by Chuck Carroll, they, bant, they backed Prosecutor, Whatcom Prosecutor Pitkin for the U.S. Attorney slot and Chuck Carroll and his allies backed a man named Joel Rindall, who had been Carroll's chief criminal deputy. It was a very close decision. Lobbying went on back and forth, focused on a man named John Ehrlichman, who was a native Seattleite, who at that time was President Nixon's key domestic advisor. Stan Pitkin was appointed. And in early 1969, Pitkin did what Rindall was unlikely to have done he launched a federal investigation of corruption in King County. So a year later in 1970, I was the candidate against Chuck Carroll. And why was I the candidate rather than some of my colleagues who are the same age but who actually had litigation experience? <laughs> and that's because I had already fled the law firm billable hour wheel to which my friends were still tethered. <laughs> After Slade Gorton was elected, he appointed me as his deputy in charge of consumer protection, which had the added advantage of giving me a platform. I had a weekly radio program on KVI called Con Man Out <laughs> to warn people against fraudsters who lurked and called them on the phone. So the campaign in 1970, the real campaign, uh, which is the focus of the book, was the 1970 Republican primary race for county prosecutor. And there were some great stories from that campaign. We were all uh, around 30 years old and, and you know, very idealistic and, and very committed and very ambitious. But we had one really important senior advisor named Mort Frain. And Mort said one time at a meeting, he said, you ought to talk to Chuck and just tell him you're going to run against him as a courtesy. So I said, fine, Mort, uh, will you come with me? Uh, so we called on the prosecutor. He was in his office at a very long conference table, flanked by William Boeing, Jr and the uh, finance chairman of the county Republican Party. Chuck Carroll blustered that several of his senior deputies who had tried multiple murder cases were not qualified for this important job. He told me of the red phone by his bed that summoned him to murder sites in the middle of the night. I politely told him I thought I could do a better job and we parted politely. Now, Mort Frayn was a wonderful man, I have fond memories of him. He lost the race for mayor against Wes Ullman, 
And one of the reasons might have been that his campaign advisory committee were all people of his age. They were all in their 60s. They were part of the establishment. And they actually approved his campaign button, which simply read MF for Mort Frank. <laughs> I'm sure the establishment members of his campaign committee had no idea there was another meaning. So we, we started our campaign, we met with the prosecutor, he was I'm sure dismissive of this young whippersnapper, but we had a problem. We launched the campaign, he finally filed after dithering until the last moment for re-election, but he would not appear with me. He departed on his yacht for Northern Waters. This was a perfect strategy for him because he had always run re-election, won re-election, based on endorsements from lawyers and a couple of ads in the Seattle papers. So we had to figure out how to smoke him out. So after he returned from his cruise, we appointed my friend Keith Dysart to track him and figure out his daily movements. And one evening I was appearing at Garfield High School and we had a system for uh, communicating, which, as you all know, in those days, you had to do this on pay phones. So we had an hourly check-in. I'd check in, where is he, what's he doing, and this was very routine. But, but as I was at Garfield, Keith Darsart said, Chuck Carroll's on his way to the Lake City Library to talk to the 46th District Republican Club. So we raced out there, and just as we got there, we saw Chuck's, uh, chief of Staff, or I guess his Chief Criminal Deputy, Neil Shulman, on the payphone in the parking lot, and we think he was trying to reach Carol to tell him, don't come, the PI has arrived, King TV is here, there are cameras. This was the last thing they wanted, but he never reached him. And so the prosecutor arrived, he went in, the friendly chairman of the 46th District Republicans called the meeting to order, and just as the prosecutor was about to speak, my friend Dysart, who was sitting next to me in the back, stood up and said, Mr. Carroll, why won't you appear with your opponent and debate the issues? And of course, what is Chuck Carroll to say? Of course, anywhere, anytime. At which point I rushed to the front of the room. <laughs> the PI photographer caught me with my finger in his face, accusing him of something, and the cameras were rolling for King TV the next day. Uh, and it was a total success. Uh, Carol had to say something, so he accused me of being a tool of the Eastern establishment and said that my campaign had been financed by Nelson Rockefeller. <laughs> if only that were true. <laughs> so it was a, you know, after that, there wasn't much to happen. We'd gotten our pictures, the, the TV footage was there, and we let the meeting continue and we departed. But that was a really important thing. Uh, the Lake City ambush, as we call it, made a real race of it. And a month later, when the votes were counted on September 16th, I beat Carroll nearly two to one in the Republican primary, 120,000 to 60,000. Democrats Ed Heavey and Lem Howell were well behind at 40,000 and 20,000. But to show that my victory was heavily dependent on Democrats, who hated Carroll, but who under the blanket primary law could vote for me to get rid of him. Six weeks later, in the general election, I beat Ed Heavey in a recount by 1,400 votes out of 350,000. The Democrats ran a brilliant ad in the last two weeks called the Puppet Ad, which you can see in the book, and I think if the election had been a week later, we would have lost. So this whole thing is filled with fortuitous things like Stan Pitkin, like the, grand, like the trial of Chief, Assistant Chief Buzz Cook during the primary and many other things that are recounted in the book. So anyway, we won barely after a recount and in January 1971, I took office. Chuck Carroll had not left us much to work with. All the office manuals had been destroyed the big desk I inherited was empty, except in the bottom right-hand corner, a right-hand drawer, the back of the drawer was, was taken out, and there were a whole bunch of wires. 
To me, this symbolized one of his methods to maintain power. Like J. Edgar Hoover later, he had a file on everyone and maybe a tape. So our new team, chiefs of three divisions, and my chief of staff were all about the same age, 32. We all graduated from college around 1960. We were young, idealistic, and completely inexperienced. We had two main challenges. First, as we had promised in the campaign, to call and conduct a grand jury investigation into the police corruption, which had now been well documented and exposed by Stan Pitkin's investigations and by his perjury trial of Assistant Chief Buzz Cook. The second thing we had to do, and in many ways more important, was to reorganize and reform the office to eliminate politics and selective prosecution. So the first of these, the grand jury was convened in May. It focused on the police payoff scandal. And in July, issued a massive indictment charging conspiracy to construct and maintain an illegal system. At these talks, people asked me, why did we bring a case as conspiracy as opposed to individual charges against those, either the police officers or others uh, involved? And the answer is, even though it's a very tough case to prove, and we learned that lesson, sadly, uh, it, was, it enabled us to tell the whole story uh, before an open court of what the system was, who was part of it, and, and the people who were indicted were all major players in the system, one way or the other. The people charged in this indictment included Charles O'Carroll himself, a former sheriff, and many high-ranking police officials. The case was immediately dismissed by a visiting judge from Kittitas County, uh, and it took us six months to get it reinstated uh, by going to the Supreme Court. Appeals went on for two years, and after the final cases were over, we ended up convicting only a few of the alleged conspirators. But the case drove a stake through the heart of the corrupt system. And after years of on-again, off-again payoffs, the Seattle Police Department has been free of that type of scandal ever since. The second task, reforming the office. And there are several people here who were involved in that. Chuck Harrell's office had been professional and competent so reforming it did not mean firing the staff and starting all over, which is exactly what he did in 1948 when he was appointed to the office. The flaws were that he ran the office as a political and partisan fiefdom. The political part meant that deputies were expected to obtain lawyer endorsements on their work time and to work in re-election campaigns by making signs and distributing them. It was partisan because new hires were vetted by the King County Republican Central Committee. Even more important, Chuck Carroll engaged in what I call selective prosecution. And my term here means that he ignored the well-documented payoff system, but he vigorously prosecuted political protesters and flag desecration cases. And this was at the time of the Vietnam War. There are a lot of both. One example, uh, Carroll charged a group of 18-year-olds who had conducted a sit-in at Franklin High School with felonies. The case came before Superior Court Judge Robert Utter, who dismissed or reduced the charges. Prosecutor Carroll was furious. He called Bob Utter on the phone and chewed him out with harsh language. When I interviewed later Justice Utter a year ago for this book, before he died, he was still upset about this. But being a gentleman, he declined to reveal the actual curse words that <laughs> Carroll had used. There were many other stories of prominent citizens or husky football players receiving favorable treatment. And in each case, the prosecutor kept a record and reminded those favored later 
when they were asked for political contributions. I looked for examples uh, in the first year that would show how different things would be, that would really be a stark a contrast to this. And one came uh, involving a brand new deputy named Bill Flegeltaub. And the new deputies in the office were assigned to what we call the district courts, the, the misdemeanor courts scattered around the county, either in small towns or as part of the county justice system. And these new deputies uh, told the police in their jurisdictions, you know, if you have any questions, call me any time of the night or day. I'm available as your resource. So one night at two in the morning, uh, a police officer from a suburban district called Bill Flegeltaub at two o'clock in the morning. He said, I've got the mayor of Clay Ellum here locked up for drunk driving. What should I do? <laughs> Bill said, treat the mayor like anyone else, and he went back to sleep. The next week, there was a, every week we had a training session for the new deputies uh, with a, a wonderful man named Fred Yates, who was one of our senior deputies who conducted the training and answered questions and helped them learn how to do their jobs. I never went to these meetings. They were at 7.30 on Wednesday morning. But the next Wednesday, I went to the meeting to commend a surprised Bill Flegeltaub. The word of this and other examples got out and thus began our justice model of how a prosecutor's office should behave. Over time, this application of our unique power to prosecute or not, and for what, had a, has a, had a positive influence, not only on, on the police, but on judges above and on the community at large. The next thing we had to do was show that the office would be non-political. And I was really lucky because an obvious candidate for chief criminal deputy was David Berner. Uh, he had worked for the previous attorney general, a Democrat named John O'Connell. He was a well-known Democrat. I appointed him chief criminal deputy and sent him out to talk with all the deputies. First of all, they were nervous, so I wanted him to tell them they would not be fired, they would be retained. And actually, the only new people in the office in 1971 were the boss himself, the chief of staff, and the three division chiefs. So the story of how we professionalized the office is best known by those who actually experienced it. And that includes the carryover deputies, new hires over the next few years. But there were, they were obvious things we did. We looked for and promoted talent from within. We interviewed at law schools where a recruiting prosecutor had never darkened the placement office door. We hired and promoted women who were now beginning to study law in increasing numbers. In, in contrast to my law school class a few years earlier, which had 12 women and 540 men. I now want to emphasize that our justice model means not only treating everyone equally, and prosecuting all good cases regarding, regardless of politics. It means the prosecutor is a key player in the justice reform efforts and should be active in that pursuit. It's not enough for the prosecutor to sit and wait for the police to bring a case and decide yes or no on the prosecution and go on to the next case. The prosecutor should engage in public debate we were active in Olympia on legislative battles involving juvenile justice and sentencing reform. But after I left, after two terms, what I had done pales by comparison to what Norm Mailing did and what Dan Satterberg still does. Mailing was in Olympia during every session, leading the fight for justice reform. He paid special attention to the victims of crime and in murder cases actually got to know the families personally. Each time a new African-American minister moved to Seattle, Norm called him to welcome him to town, and they were all hymns in those days. More recently, Dan Satterberg has been a national reform leader, working on things he would never imagine was, would be of concern to the prosecuting attorney. School discipline policies, where easy expulsion can propel a kid down the wrong path. 
Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion, which is a national effort called LEAD, works, working with the police, the ACLU, defense attorneys, and others to find alternatives to incarceration for early offenders. And finally, taking another look at those who are serving life sentences in Walla Walla uh, under the Three Strikes Law that was enacted back in the Tough on Crime 1980s. Uh, Dan has joined in clemency petitions for worthy cases, urging the governor to do that. Recently, Satterberg was invited to a dinner in New York hosted by entertainer John Legend, who founded something called Free America, a nonprofit aimed at finding ways to move our country out of what has been called the era of mass incarceration. So these King County initiatives have had a big impact. 20 years ago, we contributed about one third of the state inmates for drug crimes. Today, it's about 7%. Because of this, the percentage of inmates serving sentences for drug crimes in Washington's correction institutions has fallen from nearly 25% to 10% over these years. My final point is to re-emphasize that the public prosecutor is the natural leader in criminal justice reform. John Legend understood this when he convened his New York dinner. Public anguish over Ferguson, Baltimore, Staten Island, and now Chicago, and those, all the other tragedies in between can't be erased. But convincing prosecutors all over the country to become active reformers like Dan Satterberg is the best way forward. It's step by step. It will take years, but it provides hope and a way to move the reform discussion onto a positive path. Thank you very much. How do we do questions? I can't see anybody, so. Well, that's probably fortunate. Chris, it's Lem Howell. Lem! I'm so glad to see you. Uh, I, I hope you approve of your picture. Yes, thank you very much. It's page 124. <laughs> <laughs> I, I read your book, all right? And it's very interesting, and I would urge everyone to get a copy of it. But let me ask you, with the gift of hindsight, do you now agree with the ACLU that the prosecutor has a conflict of interest in dealing with potential police criminal conduct because the two work so closely together? That's a very good question, Lem, and you're a very well qualified person to ask that question. The problem is that the prosecutor has the primary responsibility to decide on charging of any person, whether it's a police officer or somebody else. Uh, in, the, in the modern era, as the book points out, it's much more difficult to, res to responsibly charge a police officer because of the new ingredient in convicting a, a police officer, the malice ingredient. So uh, I don't think it's a conflict of interest, but I think it creates a huge problem to explain your decision, whatever it, whichever it is, and as you know, we went both ways on that. We were, we were praised by the ACLU and you and others for, for certain cases, and we were denounced for others. So, it, you know, it depends on how you define conflict of interest. The problem is that nobody else can do this. The prosecutor is the only one. Oh, I, I agree with that. I was primarily talking about the inquest system. Ah. The police investigate the shooting, and then the prosecutor decides whether to prosecute. And Carol used to use it as a whitewash, and in fact, my agenda was different from yours. That's why I entered that race, because I knew you and Heavey would not punch. Uh, uh, okay, but... I'm but, such but, a gentleman. Actually, uh, Lem, Lem, you served a huge purpose in that election by tearing him apart. <laughs> okay, but... <laughs> Chris, what I'm really concerned with, for example, you said in your book that 
the fact that you may not prevail in the prosecution would not deter you from bringing charges. And that was admirable. And then you now, before this great audience, and I like to see the gray hair, you praise Dan Satterberg. And we have that clear case of John Williams minding this, this drunk Indian minding his own business with a little three inch knife whittling. And a cop comes in and says, drop that knife. And four se seconds later, shoots him. And there was no charge brought. I say Satterberg was gutless. I'm sorry. You're entitled to that opinion. Okay, any other, is Ed Heavey here by any chance? <laughs> Chris, it's yes. Howard. Howard. I have a historical question. I'm glad to not, hear that. Not too historical, but it's not current. So 1988, the Wami massacre. Right. Um, and it occurred in the, I believe in the fall, and we, my family and I, were just leaving town, so we weren't able to stay around for, the, for how, how it evolved. But there was great shock that there were gambling clubs uh, down in the ID. And was that a shock? Was that part of police corruption? Were there payoffs to turn a blind eye toward that type of activity? I don't think so, but I'm not an expert on that. As I say, it was after my time. I think that was a completely illegal and unknown activity within that community. And uh, it was like gangs. It was, it was uh, not something that was subject to legal control. Uh, but I don't know. I don't think, though, that the, 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 the example would have been before the payoff system ended, that would have been a license activity by the city and the police would have tolerated it. I don't think that was the case. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Anybody else? Come up to the front because I can't see anybody. Well, well, why is it? Oh, I'm on this side. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I got to go both ways here. Uh, but why is it they hardly ever prosecute uh, uh, perjury for p police officers? Like when they're, even when they find out they're covering it up for other officers, why is it they hardly ever prosecute for perjury? So. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Perjury means lying in an official place, you know, like you've taken an oath and you're in a court or something. I don't know if that applies to a witness statement or to something else. Uh, and you must have specific cases in mind, but I don't know about those. Uh, I agree that a, law, a, a public official, whether it's a police officer or somebody else, uh, who does something uh, morally wrong like that is, should be dealt with in some way, whether it's being prosecuted or dismissed or bit disciplined or whatever. And it seems like, the, like whenever the police officers are whistleblowers, against other police officers, they're always usually punished for it. So. That should not be. Uh, the, in fact, the whole, our whole police department, which I'm not really an expert on at all anymore, is, as you know, been under review and under a, a federal uh, uh, mandate with someone named Merrick Bob to, to uh, really watch the reforms and approve of them and so on. That's all going on and there are arguments about the speed of it and other things. Uh, but the whole idea is that a public agency like a police department, even though it's quasi-military like police departments are, should be open and subject to review. Okay, yes. I, I was um, listening to you make a couple comments about Chicago, and I was just curious, what do you think is going to happen, and how much pain is going to happen? There? I think Chicago's huge, and, and it, we haven't seen the end of it, or the beginning of the end of it. Uh, I'm working now, and Glenn here in the front and I are working on an op-ed, which we're going to try to get published in the New York Times, because we're really trying to make this book get become part of the national debate because the issues are happening over and over again. And the point of the op-ed will be that who, what was the prosecuting attorney doing knowing that there was a tape of this episode, knowing that there was another tape from a Burger King uh, and doing nothing. The prosecutor is the one person who can charge someone with a crime. And it's not the police chief, it's not the mayor. All of the efforts are now focusing on the mayor and the police chief, but I'm waiting for someone to, to say to the woman who's the prosecuting attorney, why weren't you doing your job? And maybe that's what we'll see in our op-ed. Uh, 
Steve, oh, I'm sorry, I read oh, it way, left yeah. and right, yeah. <laughs> Um, so you were mentioning about how you kind of see the role of the prosecutor as being an advocate for reform and criminal justice reform, and so I guess, but then at the same time, how impossible it is to charge police officers um, with unjustified, or with homicide here in Washington because of the way that the statute is written. And so I'm curious as to what, how you think the prosecutor's role in advocating for criminal justice reform in that area is, and what they should be doing, should they be using the statute more um, I guess, savvily, or should they be advocating for changing that statute so that it's more possible to actually... Well, the, the statute was changed because of an earlier prosecution where people thought it was too easy to convict a police officer. Uh, and this will go back and forth. Uh, I happen to think the current statute, which is the most limited in the country, is yes, too limited. And it should be modified. Uh, and I'm sure there are people in the legislature thinking about that. Because a, a, a police officer should be judged uh, as an officer of the state who's trained to, um, well, as, as Sue Rar, the new head of the police academy, says, that we should be guardians, not warriors. And to me, that's a really important thing in the culture of a police department. So when someone behaves like uh, Officer Burke did, uh, no, that's pretty close to criminal conduct without this malice ingredients. So I think Lem is right. That statute is now too limited. Yeah. Steve. Chris, you know, um, as someone you hired out of law school, um, and having participated in the prosecutor's office in the late 70s, I wonder to what extent, when did we miss it that the sort of war on crime and the war on drugs really was having such a disparate impact in terms of racial justice. And to the extent to which you know, crack cocaine became such you know, a, a huge scourge, well, you know, regular powdered cocaine you know, was not prosecuted because generally it happened in people's homes as opposed to um, out on the streets. How did we miss it in I, terms I, of you yeah. know, the levels of incarceration and the impacts it's had on racial justice in this country? I don't know about that particular question. Uh, I think the 80s was a time of tough on crime, three strikes and all that. Uh, we went much too far because the per some of the people in Walla Walla for life, their third felony might have been a third degree assault. So that's why I think it's good for Satterberg to be reviewing those things and, and seeing as part of his duty. This whole mass incarceration thing has many elements. Drug crimes is one, that's another one. Uh, I urge you, there, there's a wonderful article in the current New York Review of Books that Cynthia subscribes to, and um, by the president of Harvard, Drew Gilpin Faust, all about the whole race issue. And it's not just about criminal things, it's very deep and interesting. Um, and uh, it just, it, it's a refreshing way of looking at this so that we don't think we've solved something and it's over with. This is very inculcated to the fabric of this country. It's there. And this particular thing you're talking about, the different kinds of cocaine, is, I guess, an illustration of that. Thanks. Thanks. Yes. Hi. I wanted to ask you a series of questions, and I wanted to touch on the racial policing portion. Could you talk about how to fix that? <laughs> like, where do, we, where do we go? Because it seems like our police officers are mostly white, the criminals are mostly black, it's generally not because they're worse people than anyone else. How do you go about fixing that problem, especially in Seattle, where, yeah. Well, Seattle is, every city and every jurisdiction is different. Uh, you're reading about the Baltimore case right now where a majority of the population is black. And the jury now in this case involving the first of the police officers to be charged is I think eight blacks and four whites, and a majority of women. I don't know where the mixture goes eight, there. Nine blacks, eight women. Yeah. Uh, so um, that's a wholly different community. Our, our, you, you want the police department, and just like you want the government, to reflect the population. And I'm not sure what the ratio is in the Seattle Police Department, but I think our African-American percentage in the city is like eight or nine percent. So it's completely different for Baltimore. The real problem is the culture of a police department. Who wants to be a police officer? Now, Tim Burgess, who's here, who's now the chairman of the city council, 
uh, was a police officer. It'd be interesting to hear what he would have to say about why he became a police officer. I think we want people to become police officers because they want to serve the community by guarding the community against violence. And that's why I like Sue Rar's dichotomy of guardian versus warrior. And when you see some of these tapes of police officers shooting young black men who are running away, uh, it's, the police officer comes out of the car and freezes into a, like a Vietnam era warrior mode. And that's, I think that's a cultural and a training problem. It'll take a long time to deal with that. But I think, I mean, I'm not an expert on police reform, but that's what I think. Do you think that over-militarization of, of the police force has led to that problem? You mean the, all the surplus military equipment and the great armored vehicles? Because I don't know about people that. people who like to play video games tend to be warrior types and less guardian types? I don't know. I have a grandson who plays video games. <laughs> but his are mostly about World War II uh, Japanese airplanes, so it's a different thing. But uh, I think the, I don't know about the equipment thing. I mean, that's a whole different issue. Uh, I think it's much more about the people who are in the force and the people who are coming into the force and the people who are leading them and what models do they provide. Fritz Frink. You never know who shows up. <laughs> I'm very impressed. He was a hero of the Garfield track team back in my age. <laughs> anyway, I was curious. I think Carla Churchill was pretty active in your days. Did you have run-ins with him? Well, there are two of them, you know. Right. Um, yes, but not, fortunately, I didn't directly. He was indicted by Stan Pitkin for some uh, things in, from that grand jury, but the trial was in Spokane. The only way he kind of got close to what we were doing is because the pinball operation was so lucrative to the people who had the master license, he was contesting the license to Far West Novelties, which was Ben Saichi's organization. And there was a, a small local war about that. There were some car bombings and some other things. It never really led to much, but it kind of made the point to me that, you know, we're, we say the tolerance policy keeps out the mafia. Well, what about this local warfare that's going on with car bombings? So I really don't know much about the Calacurchos. They seemed, once they didn't get into that business, he turned to strip clubs, and as you know, that became another city council scandal. Uh, but I'm not an expert on Calacurchos. So that was more, more city-oriented than county, you think? Well, it was just, they, I think they're, they were professional criminals and, and racketeers who wanted to find illegal businesses that could make them a lot of money and figure out how to protect them. Chris. Yes. A couple of questions. One, your book is so full of detail, I'm wondering if at the time this was all going on you were keeping a personal diary. <laughs> Thankfully, no. <laughs> no, I don't, I, I, you know, I, I really did things like writing letters, so there's a lot of that sort of thing, but I never kept a personal diary. Well, I, have they, a, I had a calendar book, but not, a, not where I'd sit down at the end of every day and write down what I thought. The other question was, given the suspicious death of the pinball king, did that have you worried about your own personal safety and that of your family? And if so, did you take any steps to protect them? That's funny, that question comes up every time in these audiences. And no, we never had a threat. Uh, the closest thing we had was someone set fire to the house I was living in before Cynthia and I were married with some other bachelors in Magnolia. And it was great fun for me because one of the things I inherited from Chuck Carroll was a, a county car, a 1967 Pontiac Bonneville called the Brown Bomber. And it had a recessed lights in the grill, red flashing lights, and it had a siren. And so when we got the word that the house had, was on fire, I jumped in the car with Richard Allison, my chief of staff. We raced through Seattle, sounding the siren, and people would look you see this brown car with no lights flashing except in the grill, and it was great fun going out there. It turned out to be the Seattle Times carrier, uh, who was a pyromaniac, so it was not, <laughs> it was not what you might think. But it, it <laughs> so that's the answer. Thank yeah. you. very excited to hear about your work with uh, Stewardship Partnership. What has oh, led you to that direction? Good. And what, what do you see happening in land use in Seattle and your, where your heart is now? Thank you. <laughs>
Well, that's a, the, where your heart is now is a very good way to put it. I, uh, I had another politi exper political experience which I don't dwell upon, which is losing the primary for the U.S. Senate in 1998. And my family was fully supportive. We went around the state in, in our old convertible waving and things. Uh, but we were beaten two to one by Linda Smith in the Republican primary, which uh, proved that uh, voting is emotional, not rational. <laughs> My argument was that we'd, we'd nominated Ellen Craswell, who'd been destroyed by Gary Locke. So two years later, we nominate someone from the far right against this new, brand new Senator Patty Murray, what I call the ineffective incumbent. You know, that couldn't happen again, but it happened. Anyway, after that was over in the primary, uh, my family advised me to do something else that was equally engaging, that I really cared about. And so, uh, out of that campaign and the time we'd spent in Eastern Washington with a man named Steve Burei, who was our first executive director before David Berger, who's sitting down in front, uh, we recognized all over Eastern Washington there were people in agriculture who hated the government, but they were natural conservationists. They took care of their land for obvious reasons. Uh, and so I thought there needed to be an organization that took advantage of the fact that these conservative landowners were innately conservationists, but they hated to be told what to do. They hated the government. They didn't want handouts to build a bridge between them so the resources that were available at various levels of government and in private foundations could be applied to helping them do what they really wanted to do. So that's why we created Stewardship Partners. And 15 years later, it's been a great success. Thanks for the question. Okay, thank you everybody.